So I have to say that was a real, that was a brilliant session and I must admit I felt a wee bit anxious. I'm going to talk to you a bit about anxiety and I'm we really well versed in it because I have to say listening to James's talk there, he's definitely, I'm going to duplicate lots of his slides and so my anxiety levels were, were raised significantly, I have to say. So I'm, I'm talking the talk and I'm walking the walk today. So... Really, we've heard lots of really clever stuff all morning. It's been a great day. I hope you like We're really going to finish on the practical stuff. So practical things that you can do in your practice to take away with you today. And, and we're going to have a bit of a practice as well. So be prepared to get up and move about a wee bit too, which will not do any of us any harm, will it? What are our common respiratory causes? We're just going to gloss over these, but COPD, bronchiectasis pulmonary fibrosis and chronic asthma. There's no surprises there. The things that we're going to talk about today, though, as well, I, I hope that actually we'll be able to apply them in, in lots of cases of chronic respiratory breathlessness um, across the board. So we're, we're certainly not exclusive there. From my point of view, I really like to be able to see what I'm kind of dealing with. I have to hold my hands up and say anatomy and physiology was never my strong point in, in nursing college. Um, at all. My colleagues would completely agree with me there. So I really like to be able to visualise just what that person um, is experiencing as well and what's, what, what are the cause of their symptoms. So nothing better than our basic slides then really describing our, our airways in COPD, which, you know, really need very little explanation. We can see very well the, that level of obstruction that we've heard about all through the day. We can see how that's probably going to make somebody symptomatically breathless um, and we're, we're going to recognise that then. So I sort of, I suppose I go around with these pictures in my head and then apply it to the person in front of me. In emphysema, it's, it's a bit different. It's still certainly a condition of the airways. So what we're seeing in emphysema is much more that picture of air trapping. So they can, they can breathe the air in, that's fine, but it's actually the challenge in our patients with emphysema is to actually be able to exhale and get that breath back out again. So that's what we're, we're going to focus on that and certainly in some of, our, some of the exercises that we're going to go through. Because people will say that to you, I just want a breath in. That's what people, that's really their key motivator. They just want to get that big breath in. So hopefully we're going to go over some ways that you're going to allow people to do that or enable people to do that. I like this slide here, which sort of just really shows that the destruction in the alveoli up the end of the airways. And it seems to make sense. Somebody told me, I think maybe some one of the consultants or somebody really clever will, um, will agree or not. If we laid out our alveoli, the, the surface of that alveoli, if we laid it out flat, it would cover a tennis court. That's quite enormous, isn't it? That's a huge area of, of tissue that's waiting there just for the gas exchange, breath in and out. It's an enormous area of potential activity, breathing in and out. But I think you can see there that over the over the course of people having emphysema, the tissue becomes destroyed, it becomes thinner, the elastic is just not there. It's almost it's like that tissue on the back of your hands. You remember when you were 17, we've got a lot of young people in the audience. Remember you were 17 and you did that and it pinged back and it was lovely and all was good with the world. Do you remember these days? <laughs> I know, certainly from mine, uh, yeah, as the big 5-0 comes, it's just not pinging back now, which is a bit miserable, but never mind. But that the, exactly the same process really is happening in our lungs. But when we, do, when we do things that annoy our lungs, that accelerate that process, probably smoking being the predominant one, accelerates it and the tissue becomes destroyed and we're much more likely then to have that air trapped in our lungs. Again, I just really like to have that visual. I think it's good to connect the two. Where's James Towers, honestly? So your slides were so much more professional and academic. <laughs> so here we are. We have this therapy, we have this intervention, which absolutely the, the, Cochrane, um, the Cochrane body have said, do you know what, you don't need to study this, this intervention anymore. It works so well, it is just one of the best therapies. After stopping smoking, there's nothing else as efficient that we can do for these people who are chronically breathless. So what is it? It, it reduces anxiety levels 
hugely, it, consistently when we measure, um, it, it's shown to reduce anxiety levels. It increases people's confidence. I think crucially, it reduces hospital admissions and exacerbations. Now that's huge. Um, James showed figures there around about reducing hospital admissions. For every bed day, I think is it around about £600, I think, per bed day, per simple bed day, without any um, fancy interventions. So actually, if we can do that, that's brilliant, isn't it? It increases exercise tolerance, people can do more, and it improves quality of life. So what is it? He's kind of gave the answer away. Pulmonary rehab, isn't it? It's just brilliant. Pulmonary rehabilitation is should be the kind of bedrock, I suppose, of that we're offering to all of these people. Up here, we've got. I, I just I love the positive pictures here. Who would be? Can I, I haven't really planned this. Can I take a show of hands? Who would be confident if you had someone in front of you in clinic consultation? Who would be confident to explain to them actually what pulmonary rehab was? Just a show of hands. And that's, that's absolutely as we would expect. And, and I suppose what we've got here in this room is a group of enthusiasts as well. So who are already, who have that interest in respiratory. As a percentage, it, it's, it's fairly um, awful, I think. So this therapy, which you know, James told you about, re reduces healthcare costs, increases quality of life. We know it does this. What percentage of people who would benefit from that therapy do you think are actually referred and go through? Just shout it out. What percentage? 50? Hmm. Any advances on 50? 5%. Five. Five well, that's a, that's a wee bit pessimistic. Okay, so that, but that's good. That's, that's good. There's about 10%. It's between 8 and 10%. Chest, heart and stroke Scotland did a big survey last year in Scotland and they found it was 8%, which is pretty rubbish, isn't it? For a therapy that does all these things, it's, it's brilliant. Our numbers needed to treat are so small. But actually, I think that you, that's the answer because we don't really understand what it is. And I, I have to hold my hand up and say, I've worked across in the test unit for about 12 years. And I knew that Jude, our physiotherapist, our brilliant physiotherapist, used to disappear on a Tuesday morning and a Thursday morning and still my way to this pump. I said, well, what, what's that about? And it wasn't until I escaped into the community that I sort of take myself off and went to a class. And it's just, it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. So I suppose, this is not a talk about pulmonary rehabilitation, by the way, but I just wouldn't get away with talking about activity without it. I would really commend it to you to go along to your local class. We're fairly fortunate in NHS Highland. We've got classes in Inverness, Caithness, Sky, Sutherland. So we're, we're fairly fortunate. We still don't have nearly enough of it. And maybe we need to look at how how we actually give that to people. Maybe we have to think about doing more home-based things or doing it in the community a bit more. But certainly, yeah, I would commend it to you. So this is, again, duplication. But do you know, it's good. I sat, my heart sank a wee bit when I saw your slide. But then, actually, I'm quite an optimist. And I thought, do you know, it doesn't think because, what do we focus on when we think about breathlessness? I don't know of anybody. I feel like the queen of Oromorph sometimes. I feel I should be on commission for whoever it is that makes Oromorph. Because that's just what I talk about all the time. We, we really like to be able to, someone in front of us who is breathless, and we really like to write that prescription, don't we? And, and do something very tangible. And we like to be able to prescribe things. And actually, quite often, what we need to do is, is go back to the, the basics there and and move away from the, the pharmacological aspect, I think. So, so, and I think reinforcement and repetition is quite good as well. So I was delighted to see James on that slide. Breathlessness is really, it's complicated, doesn't it? Do you find that in your own practice? I, you know, for years, um, we talk, we was working with cancer patients, we used to talk about pain as what the patient says it is. And I think we're quite bought into that now, aren't we? We're very, you know, we listen to people. And breathlessness is very much the same, isn't it? It needs to be what the person, what you're seeing in front of you and what it, what the impact is it has on people's lives. Because absolutely that person exists who has an F. I can think of one chap um, who, over the last couple of years, I saw him, who's got an FEV1 of 23%. 
but he was the main carer for his wife who had a um, chronic Parkinson's disease. And so he used to be away up doing, he could do the shopping, he could carry two bags of shopping, fairly substantial bags of shopping. And yet he's got an FEV1 of 23%. So on paper, it looks rubbish. But actually he's doing that, he was doing all the housework needed to be persuaded to get home care in and all that kind of stuff. But then and you'll all know the person whose lung function is much, much higher, who really shouldn't be symptomatic at all and yet is very symptomatic. And that breathlessness is as real, to the, it's, it's a real thing, so it's very subjective, isn't it? The other phrase that sticks in my head, I've kind of talked a, wee, a couple of times over the past few months about breathlessness. And we did some work, I'm doing some work with Mary up north in Caithness, and we looked at some of the out of hours reports you know, for people being admitted. And on some of them it would say breathlessness and anxiety. And then when you spoke to people, you say, so what was it? Was it an exacerbation? No, it was just breathlessness and anxiety. And it was that word, I don't know what you think of that word, it was just breathlessness and anxiety. I don't know, a wee show of hands again, has anybody ever been breathless and anxious? Yeah, would, it, would you have described it as just breathlessness and anxiety? It's pretty awful, isn't it? So actually, do we have to then start thinking in terms of, because I'm sure lots of people, actually when we've gone over the paperwork, I'm sure lots of these people who have been admitted into the acute hospital, it will say an exacerbation of COPD. But in actual fact, it's probably that breathlessness and anxiety that's been a huge factor in getting to that point. So it would be really good for us to be able to start coming to terms with that and getting to grips with it. So I love this model. It's really based on work done by the Cambridge Breathlessness Intervention Service down in Cambridge. And I would commend their website too. It's brilliant for resources, for patient leaflets, etc. And really they think about that. So we've looked at that, the physiology, how we've looked at the breathing, we've looked at the, the increased work that the, the person has to do to reduce that hyperinflation of the lungs to get past the, the obstruction. The person is going to have to be doing more work. They'll be possibly using the accessory muscles. It's harder work, isn't it? If it's hard work and it, it, the breathlessness becomes unpleasant, then what do we normally do when we encounter that breathlessness? What do we do naturally? Any answers? Breathe more shallow. We breathe, we definitely breathe more shallow. Our breathing starts to change, but, but what, how does our behaviour change? Uh, let's think, we, we've been going to the co-op, okay, and go and we, we meet our neighbours, but we meet our neighbours and we're, we're having to just struggle and maybe lean against the wall. What do we want to do about that as people? exert ourselves less, we probably want to avoid it, don't we? As human beings, we're really good. Our, you know, we've evolved really cleverly to avoid threats and danger, haven't we? And that's great. In the time when there was bears, you know, around about, that was brilliant. We would be avoiding the threat of, of these. But that becomes a threat to our, our comfort, I suppose, and we very quickly then start to avoid these threats. And the way that we avoid them is by, by doing less. And that's where that, that kind of vicious circle, doesn't it, come in, where the function in there, because we do less. And you'll see it with people all the time. The people's world fairly quickly becomes much narrow, doesn't it? It becomes really quite small, unless we can help and work in partnership with them to, to reverse that. But, but fairly quickly, people's world becomes small when they start to avoid these things. We have a lady who I always think of um, out in Dingwall, and she, she worked in one of the big supermarkets and was one of these well-kent faces and we said, you know, what, what were your goals? And she just wanted to go to the bingo, but she'd stopped going and talking to anybody because she was so scared she'd go around Tesco's. And because she was one of these well-known faces, everybody would stop and speak to her. But she was so embarrassed by that breathlessness that she just very quickly, in the course of having exacerbations, she just stopped doing that. And it, her world became so narrowed very quickly. And that, we see that all the time, unfortunately. So the thinking, the, th the three really, we can't separate them. We can never separate the, what goes on up here as to what goes on physically. And our thing, it's that sort of threat to our, our comfort that we, that we start to, that becomes real. And it is real because we went to the co-op and we became breathless. And so, well, I'm not doing that again. And we, we tell ourselves that that's what's happened. So, so we need to really think of them all together. 
So, what practical thing to help? Pace and activity, that's like, that's a huge thing, isn't it? And I think, I don't know, and I'm not being sexist, but I think women find it much more difficult sometimes than men because they've always been used to doing all the housework in, you know, one morning or, or one day, and then they become so frustrated, they're just not able to do the same things. So pace and activity is huge. But positioning, and we'll see people doing that all the time. People have the tripod position, they adopt the tripod position, don't they? They lean on a wall or they, you'll see them, people will say, oh, it's fine going around Tesco's because they'll have the shopping trolley. So that support of their shoulder girdle really matters. I guess after being the queen of Oromorph, I felt a bit a couple of weeks ago like the queen of the rollator frames because rollator frames are really good for being able to give them that support and support the short shoulder girdle. Try saying that. So that's, that's really useful. Handheld fan, who's who's heard of the handheld fans? Yeah, have you used them? Absolutely brightly. James mentioned oxygen, and again, work done by Sarah Booth down in Cambridge showed that the, the handheld fan, when we direct it to our face and we put the, the flow of air down the side of our nose and our face here, it can be as effective as the, a, a blast of oxygen. And it works in the same way, really. It works, it invokes our diver's response or the response, you know, when you're a newborn baby and if you threw the newborn baby into a swimming pool, it would, it would swim, it would hold its breath and it would survive. So it's the same response as that. So the fans are brilliant. And again, they, they stimulate the trigeminal nerve down here. I can't really tell you the clever stuff in behind that, what part of the brain it works in or whatever, but, but it works really well to the point of, we had a chap a couple of months ago and we, he had fibrosis and we thought oxygen might help, but he never ever went for the oxygen, but his fan was, it was always with him. He kept his fan in his pocket and that really got him out of, of trouble sometimes. So for the handheld fan, you get them in chemists, you get them in boots, um, Amazon, in these places. I think the beauty of it is you don't have to be, you know, doing, it's not special. You can have it in your pocket. It's available any time. So, so the hand for, there's lots of really good evidence to suggest that that's good. Purse-lit breathing. I think we all um, maybe do that sometimes. Some people adopt it naturally anyway. So we'll have a wee shot of doing that in a while. And blow as you go. So actually, we're going to do that just now. I learned that. <laughs> No, you are. Yeah, you put me in the spot earlier. <laughs> Blow as you go works because I, I you know, you think, right, I have to, I tell people this all the time. I actually will do it. So I was putting a big uh, thing of logs away a couple of months ago and I got done in about, I don't know, a third of the time or something because I blew as you go. So we're going to have a wee practice of this. Okay, you look as if you could do with moving. What do we normally do, right? I would need you to think about this, okay? What people say would make them more breathless is sometimes if they were bending down. So what they'll do is they'll bend down and, oh, and they feel quite breathless then when they come back up. Or let's say they're reaching up to, for the washing line or something. So that exertion can just knock the stuffing from them. And if it knocks the stuffing from them, what do they do? What's the risk that they do? They don't do it. They avoid it. So... What we're going to do, what I want you to do is just practice how you would do it normally. I'm sorry, you've all got tables and papers in front of you and everything. But what I want you to do is just bend down to your toes, okay? And think about what, think about how you're breathing when you're doing it. And then come back up quickly. <laughs> Stop laughing. <laughs> Did you hold your breath? Is everybody aware of that, that you held your breath in as you were doing that? Okay, okay. Right, so, and that's what, that's fine. You're all, listen, we're all, a, we're a fit bunch in here, aren't we? It's all fine. But actually, you can imagine if you're um, currently breathless, that's not so good. So what we try and tell people, and it's a challenge because this is, people have breathed this way all their lives. That's the biggest challenge, I think, when breathlessness um, management. You've done this all your life and don't try and tell me how to do it. So we're trying to change a big habit. So. What we're going to ask you to do this time is as you're bending down to your toes, I'm going to get you to blow as you're using that exertion, so like this. Okay, try that. 
So as you're exerting yourself, you'll exhale. How did that feel? Is it better? Is it easy to, to get the pattern? It's not at all easy, is it, to sort of, to relearn that. It's a lovely wee thing to get people to practice. And supposing it's putting things up into that cupboard so that it's the, as you're going off to do it. And it just helps, sorry, is that okay? Yeah. So it's a lovely thing to practice, but blow as you go. That's, it's an easy one to remember, and I think that's the beauty of it, isn't it? Rectangular breathing, we're going to go and talk about that. Pursed lip recovery breathing, do we all kind of, we'll all see people doing it all the time. What I want you to do is I want you to take a breath in and then just breathe out normally. And what I want you to do is think about the, think about the tension that's inside your chest. Okay, so take a breath in, breathe out normally. And breathe out normally. Okay, quite easy. Okay. So do you remember when we looked at the picture of the damaged alveoli and all these air sacs in there that are damaged? So, so really what we want to do is we want to prevent the airways there from collapsing, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to have a breath in and then breathe out. What I want you to do when you're breathing out like that, think about the, is there, does it feel a bit different here up at your chest? How does it feel different? Do you feel a bit of tension there? And the breath out has taken that much longer, isn't it? So what we've allowed to happen inside our lungs there is we've allowed a wee bit of positive pressure to be at the airways. So we're keeping the, the entrance to that airway open. So the trapped air that's in there is just allowed to escape them. We're just letting it last longer so it's coming out. So when people say, I just want that breath in, that's all I want. Actually, what you're helping people to do is get the breath out so that you can have the breath in. So purse lip recovery breathing is, is just a really good way. And people, lots of people adopt it anyway, but it's, it can be quite tricky to actually get over to somebody who, who can't do it. So it's really good for us to be able to know how it feels as well. This is something that we do all the time and we write it down for people. So, it, and again, it's just another way. I, again, I'm quite visual, so I quite like to think of it in terms of that. So. We're there. Okay, so we ask them to smell the rose. So breathe in through our nose, so smell the rose. And you can imagine that rose in front of you. And then blow the candle. So what I want you to do is, as if you've got a candle flame in front of you and you want to flicker that candle flame, but you don't want to blow it out. If we do, what's going to happen to our flame? We're going to snuff it out, aren't we? We really want that candle flame to flicker. And it's a lovely way just to control that breath out and really allow that air in there to, to escape. And then we'll get the, the reward of the nice breath in. So smell the rose and blow the candle is something that we, we talk a lot about. And then this one here is probably my favorite because you can just, you can use this anywhere. And I know that because I'm not a good flyer and I was on the plane to uh, Barcelona at the weekend and it started getting a bit sugly. And I thought, okay, okay, right. This is what we're going to do, we're going to, you can do this anywhere. There's rectangles everywhere. The most important thing with this exercise is that our breath in is shorter than our breath out. So remember that the picture of that alveoli, we really want to help all the trapped air that's in here. We want that to, to really come out. And we're going to do that by making that breath out last longer. So, now this is just one that I made up, but there's lots of examples of all over the place. The West Coast where I practice, it's lovely. People have normally got a lovely big picture window that we can look at or, or a picture above their fireplace or something. So everybody's always got something. But we really just want to, to breathe out along the long section and breathe in in the shorter section. So, and it's something that we would ask people to practice when things are good. It's not, this is not going to be learned in an exacerbation, but when things are good, it's going to be one of their tools that we get people to do. And self-talk, you know, we talked about there's um, CBT approaches and that sort of self-talk, so how we start to change behaviour. Sometimes we'll ask people just to simply pat their chest, not to, you know, bring their breathing under or slow it down, 
if they're breathless, they're going to be breathing at a faster rate. But to understand that this is safe, it will pass because it's happened before, they know how to deal with it, they can do that. And so sometimes we'll just ask people just to, just to gently pat their chest and say, this, this will pass, I'm safe, I can do this, I've done it before, I'm doing it now. And actually just the very act of that and hearing their voices, sometimes it's, it's enough to, to bring that back under control. So this is what some of our people say, they, you know, they would just would be lost without their fan or the picture of breathing is, is what they like best. I think this is quite poignant, isn't it? Lots of our people say they feel daft because they think it's just panic and anxiety. But actually, when you start to look, we don't have time here to think about the role of adrenaline and driving that panic and anxiety. It's far from just panic and anxiety, isn't it? So it's, it's good to think about that. I think I just put that slide down because I think we need to just deal with people with kindness, don't we? These people sometimes, or certainly the, the folks who I see, have often been in and out of Rigmore or whatever hospital lots of times. Um, so they've had lots of dealings with different people saying it's just panic and anxiety. And so actually a bit of kindness to start to unpack that then um, as well as looking at the inhaler technique is always useful. And that's just a link to the Cambridge Breathlessness Society. So thanks for your time. Thank you.